giving this tutorial individually to a lot of people who come over here and uh, so I figured maybe once and for all I could uh, get everybody together and then deliver this tutorial okay. and all right uh, I will try to make this uh, very systematic so that I can try to cover everything and um, as a overview uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I will talk to you about uh, the types of uh, speed fishing so that uh, when you approach the game you have an overall idea a better picture of the speed game uh, in, uh, uh, as a whole and then the, I will talk about uh, uh, the target species, uh, the type of speed that we are going for and uh, after that uh, we will talk about some basic gear what you should know about uh, rods, reel, line, leader, snap and so on and we will, I will then spend more time, a little bit more time <coughs> talking about the eggy itself which is the speed jig uh, some of the characteristics uh, size, color selection, uh, sing rate, uh, etc. So after that, uh, I will also share with you uh, how to work uh, the jig in a different environment. And then, uh, of course, uh, I will also share with you some of the popular areas when I started squid fishing uh, in Singapore, uh, the areas that I go to, which are uh, until today, still as productive as ever. So, uh, this game uh, has led me to think that it is truly sustainable. Alright, so um, let's start off with the types of squid fishing. And um, basically, uh, I would like to categorize uh, squid fishing into two separate categories. One is land based, and the other one would be uh, offshore or shore base uh, but for today we will just focus uh, more on uh, land based uh, egging uh, techniques including the eggies used because in both game um, there are different types of eggy and different type of gear to be used so that could be used for another topic if you have the opportunity in the future to do so so for today we will just focus on land based egging now in land based uh, form of egging right there are also two categories or two ways that you really work the jig and one is in a deep water environment and there's one in the shallower uh, environment deep water environment would mean uh, for instance our friend just came back from uh, Batam View Batam View the jetty those are considered deeper environment deep water environment where you <coughs> basically just let the egg drop all the way to the bottom and then hop it in the bottom so that is and this is also applied um, to Kelong uh, jetties uh, not only Batang view like uh, even Bado jetty or if you are fishing at uh, Labrador Park jetty as well so these are considered slightly deep water environment whereas a uh, shallow water land based uh, environment would mean uh, going to the islands like St. John's Island, uh, Kusu, where you need to cast and then you need to gauge uh, at a certain time of the day or a certain time of tide, the level of the tide, uh, how deep the water is. But generally from shore base uh, and uh, casting from breakwaters would be shallow water as compared to jetty. Okay, so yeah. these are the two different categories. I will show, I will also explain to you uh, later on how uh, I try to, uh, uh, how I do again in these two different kind of uh, uh, environment and using what kind of speed jig for this kind of environment. Alright, and um, so that covers uh, uh, the types of egging. So yeah. uh, just to give you an overview about uh, of course, we are not going to go into this in detail, but just give an overview uh, of boat egging. Uh, basically, in boat egging, there are a few distinct types. Uh, one is uh, what we call a pit run egging, where you actually use uh, quite a heavy uh, jig head from 30 grams to 50 grams, and you are fishing in uh, 
uh, something like 30 meters to, to 40 meters of water. In Japan, uh, I believe they will fish a lot deeper water as well. So that is called tip run egging. Uh, the gear is slightly different from the shore egging. And then, uh, of course, there's also another type called metal gin. Uh, sorry, I didn't bring my frog here, but I actually wanted to show you what is a metal eggy. A uh, metal gin um, basically is to target uh, another type of squid, the long elongated, the one with the slimmer arrow, uh, longer body. This kind of squid you can find uh, in the market uh, more often. So these are the arrow ones that they use to target with uh, using metal gain. It's very much like an Apollo style, uh, where you have a sinker and then uh, you branch off with a couple more of those uh, squid jigs which are very light. So that is metal gain. It is uh, different from this kind of AD that you attach to the Apollo. So at least we have that. And then of course, uh, from the boat, you could also do a combination. Um, uh, there's no name for it yet, but uh, it is basically uh, being going to an island and for certain reasons you are not able to land on an island, then you will uh, ask the boatman to bring your boat closer to the island and you cast into the island from the boat. So it's not land-based and it's not deep run again. So it's a combination of land-based type of again. Uh, those kind you will use the normal land based digging because you will be casting into rocks, coral areas and those are considered uh, shallower waters. So if you try to dump in a quick run 30 gram uh, AG, you're going to get snagged and you're going to lose the AG. Okay. So in a nutshell, uh, that is the type of uh, uh, street fishing that is known to us today or at least known to me today. Maybe there might be uh, different styles coming up tomorrow or uh, next year or what that I don't know of. So um, basically that's uh, the style of fishing. Next we are going to talk about uh, the type, uh, our target species, okay, uh, which is very interesting. Now basically when we talk about egging, we are talking about going for this uh, um, big fin reef squid, alright. Uh, this is um, by Chase Bait. Uh, I see I think brings in this one, right? So, yeah. So these are the uh, target species that we are going after. And uh, of course, uh, there's another uh, squid that we can actually see in the market. Um, of course, this one is not so common in the market. Sometimes uh, certain markets you can find this, but uh, not uh, very often. The more often type you see will be the arrow one, the one with a bit of uh, the elongated ones. Uh, narrow body so those are arrow squid and they, that's why uh, we call it arrow squid because of uh, looks like an arrow um, then there's one more type uh, is uh, the cuttlefish uh, not to be confused uh, although they do for for rod um, any kind of rod from between seven to nine feet would be suitable for egging so uh, again, uh, you have to, if you are in the market for, a, for an egging rod, um, <clears throat> do consider what kind of fishing or what kind of style you'll be in. If you, are, if you know that you're going to be fishing from the jetty uh, most of the time, then consider uh, you can get away with a short, slightly shorter rod. But if you are going to be spending a lot of time casting in the islands, uh, covering ground, exploring, then you might uh, want to get a slightly longer rod. Um, all things being equal, uh, a longer rod will cast the same AG further and hence you could cover a bit more ground. But having said that, it also depends on how tall or short you are. If you are very, uh, you are not, uh, of course if you are a very tall person like Manchuna, uh, then you can always opt for a slightly longer rod. <coughs> but if you are very short, and you want to try and go for a 9 feet rod thinking that you can cast very far um, it becomes very clumbersome whenever you <coughs> want to track the line or when you snag your eggy then you can't reach your rod you know so uh, bear all this in mind before you make a decision uh, personally uh, I'm not very tall uh, I find that uh, I'm using an A3 and it suits me fine okay I can manage even if uh, I'm in a snack situation. I just leave my rod on my shoulder and I can reach the line and 
try to uh, release the eggy, the snack eggy. Okay. All right, real. Uh, real wise, we recommend um, or, or we don't recommend. Uh, basically, we uh, we feel that um, any reel from two thousand size to three thousand size would be suitable for egging. Uh, however, we do recommend a shallow spool uh, because it has an impact on the on the the line that you're going to load into it. So uh, this will lead on to the line. Uh, line we will recommend something like uh, zero point six pe to pe one. Uh, this range of line you can use for egging. Of course, the thinner the line uh, will enable you to cast your eggy further, and you also allow your eggy to sink better because it's thinner and less water resistance. Okay, because this is a great line. So, um, uh, bear that in mind, uh, if you end up with uh, a deep spool and you're trying to load, um, say, uh, 150 meters of 0 0.8 PE line, then you might have a little bit of trouble and uh, you may need to apply backing. Uh, and uh, if you don't do that, then maybe you will not be able to cast as far as those uh, that has a properly filled spool. Okay? Um, Alright, uh, we will then move on to a leader. Um, normally, I don't use a very long leader. I only use up to one meter because I try to keep the knot uh, outside the tip guide. Uh, I do not cast uh, with the knot inside because it will take off distance from my cast. That's number one. Number two, you will also then you will also due to the friction, you will also damage. Uh, there's a likelihood that my knot can be damaged as well. So for that reason, if I'm using a 7 feet rod or 8 feet rod, uh, 1 meter length of uh, a leader should be good enough for cushioning uh, in case you, you, you hit a very big squid and last minute you decide to give a very hard pull, you have a little bit of uh, stretch and cushioning there. Uh, because remember your uh, braided line have no stretch so you want to have a little bit of a cushion or shock absorber absorbing properties so you have that one meter and of course um, uh, having a fluorocarbon line will also help you because uh, it is uh, help you from abrasion uh, is abra abrasion resistance so you especially if you're fishing in the coral rocky areas so sometimes you do get in contact with rocks uh, you will get cut off can all right and um, now at the end of the leader, I will attach a snap. Uh, there are many types of snap in the market today. So uh, do find a snap that, uh, that will suit uh, the size of the eggy that you are fishing with. Try, to, try not to have it uh, too big. All right? And uh, you do not really need to use uh, a swivel because uh, for the eggy, right, it doesn't spin very much. Uh, not like a spinner bait and then you won't result in line twist so having the correct size uh, eggy snap is also good uh, so it doesn't interfere with the actual balance uh, of the squid jig itself okay rather than use an oversized one yeah and um, another reason why we use a snap is that it will protect the tie point uh, of the leader uh, from abrasion as well, from damage. So imagine um, if you were to tie your leader directly to the to the squid jig, and uh, the squid jig then contacts the bottom, right? It will contact the bottom this way, and then of course during some movement, some movement, you might get a bit of uh, uh, damage to the knot itself. So when we attach a little uh, metal piece there, it will help uh, to prevent this kind of damage. So always use a snap for squid fishing. Okay, uh, now we move uh, on to, to um, the squid jig itself. Um, and uh, I'm going to share with you certain characteristics of the squid jig. Uh, not all squid jigs are made the same. Uh, Probably what is important for you to know is uh, more important for you to know would be the sink rate. Uh, do not just buy uh, a squid jig and then next thing you know hook it up to your step and then go and cast. All right. Spend some time, have a look at the squid jig, and uh, importantly understand the sink rate. Most of the time they will state 
the sing rate on the packaging. So uh, certain squid jigs, like for example the uh, this Yamashita uh, K model, all right, it says here three seconds per meter. So you know that this uh, squid jig will sing at three seconds per meter, all right. Uh, it's why you mind bring me one two point five on top there. Uh, same uh, model, but this is of a smaller size. And this one says in the packaging that it sings at 5. six seconds. Uh, sorry, five seconds per meter. Can you see? Is it five five seconds per meter? Yeah. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, knowing the sing rate uh, of an eggy can maximize the fun of squid fishing and minimize the chances of snagging. So uh, spend a little bit of time uh, understanding the sing rate uh, first and foremost. So, uh, but how does sing rate affect us when we are fishing? Okay, when we go to the islands and then we are assuming we cast out and we are fishing in say 5 meters of water. Based on a sing rate of uh, 3 seconds per meter, we will know that it takes about uh, 15 seconds 15 seconds uh, to reach for the eggy to contact the bottom. So what we do is that uh, at the 13 second or 14 second mark, we just we pull our eggy up okay? and then we let it sink again. And we do a countdown. And how, of course how we know is we try to do a countdown. When we cast out, then we do a countdown uh, roughly you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, that kind of countdown. It is better than just uh, estimating. So you do a count. Um, size. What size do I use? So generally, I when I fish in a deep water environment, still shore land based, uh, like Jetty or Kelong, I tend to want to use a smaller size uh, jig. Uh, why do I do that? Uh, you okay? Maybe not really naturally smaller, but um, have a look at the bait fish around the area and try to mimic the size because the profile and the contrast uh, shouldn't be too big and shouldn't be unnatural for the squid that are around the area. If they are used to a fish eating this fish this size, you try to present a longer, bigger, of course naturally uh, your heat rate will not be as high. And uh, when I talk of, when I say a, a bait fish, it doesn't mean those bait fish that are swimming on top of the water that you can see. It is basically some of the fish that are also bottom. For example, you have uh, you know those uh, uh, red spot emperor, the lingjiang, small lingjiang, and you know the uh, sand white things at Pongo Jetty. You have a lot of those sand white things. They are not very big, so you try to mimic. And uh, for that reason. Uh, people in Pongo Jetty and some of the jetties are using smaller jigs like the 2.5, 2.2. Some even go down to 1.8 to mimic some of the bait fish and that is uh, effective for them. Now, when I go to the islands and I try to cover the ground, the area, then I would tend to use something bigger. I use up to 3, 3.5. And why do I do that? It's because uh, it is a bigger area and visibility is the key. You compare presenting a small jig and a big jig, which one is more visible, especially the water is clear. All right? So uh, I tend to use a bigger jig, but when I go to the Kelongs, I go to the jetties, I will also downsize to maybe sometimes 2.2. But then of course the 2.2 is very light. Uh, unless you attach a sinker to it and bring it down, you may not be able to go down because it's deep water. So that's why for that reason, I always recommend to try to go for a faster sinking jig which is available. So normally those are called the uh, deep models. Okay, if you use a shallow one in a deep water environment, it's going to be very boring. You'll be waiting, waiting, waiting. It just doesn't go down at all. All right. Yeah. Uh, color selection. Um, as you can see, if you are very new to. Uh, Squid fishing, you will find that uh, it's very com it gets very confusing. You walk into a taco shop and you see all these colors not facing, then you don't know which one to use. Oh my god, what color? Or should I just buy, you know, whatever color that uh, I feel I like, you know? Um, okay, not to worry, I'll try to make sense, uh, some sense of it. 
uh, I won't go into very specific details, but uh, at least uh, after this uh, small tutorial, you have an idea of uh, how squid jig color works. Um, now, very briefly, I would want to. Okay, you can see in front of you. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it this way. Is it better if I put it this way? Mm -hmm. Can you see? Mm -hmm. All right. So categorize them is um, the bright colors and the natural colors. Bright colors I will tend to use when the squid uh, is very aggressive and very active. They are in a feeding mode. They will attack anything. So the bright colors uh, is what I will use during those times. But of course, sometimes I will see squid around and then you cast they shy away. Maybe they, they, will, they will just follow for a while, but then they will shy away again. So those uh, will, will be an indication to me that uh, they are not very active. And I will quickly then change to something more natural, which is uh, something like uh, something that they are more used to, you know, uh, like a small fish or something like that. Alright, now this is only part one of the color scheme. Most squid jigs uh, are designed with two color patterns and uh, the second color color pattern that you should uh, try to be familiar and you should be able to find a consistent color throughout the body from the nose to the hooks all right and uh, like this one i detected that this one looks very silver maybe you want to have a closer look uh, very consistently throughout the entire squid chick it is silver in color and uh, this one is gold in color all right throughout the squid jig and then this one is uh, red in color throughout the entire squid jig and of course uh, this one you can see a lot of colors all right and this one is what we call a rainbow base color squid jig and this one a gold base and a squid jig and uh, a red base squid jig. Now what all this uh, base uh, mean? For me, I tend to want to use uh, the reds. The reds like uh, pink, purple or even uh, red. I tend to use this at night or very low light conditions. And uh, I would like to use the gold bases uh, for maybe morning sun or evening sun, the golden hour. All right? And then, of course, the very bright, shiny ones, I tend to use it when there's very, very bright sunlight. But having said that, uh, there's no fixed and fast rule. There's no rule to say that you cannot use the red base for daytime fishing as well. So uh, you can always mix and match. But then see what works for you for that place that you are fishing and what you have in your arsenal, what you have in your bag, then take up to use. Uh, another base is uh, something that looks like very plastic. You cannot detect any golden fall color inside there. And this is, uh, um, the Japanese call this Kemura, which is a UV glow. Uh, what it means is that, um, as you know, a UV light, is not really visible to our naked eye but it is definitely there and the UV light will penetrate uh, deeper than normal light visible light so when uh, you encounter very cloudy overcast skies where it's not very very bright then do take out your Kimura and give it a go alright and uh, if you only have if you have budget for only one squid jig Alright, if you're starting out, you don't want to spend too much money, then uh, I suggest that you go look for a rainbow base, uh, which is more versatile. You can use it in the day, you can use it in the evening, you can use it at night, and so on. Of course, there's also another there are another type of uh, squid jig, which is uh, Lumo. Uh, it has a Lumo base. If you shine a UV light or shine a torch light over it, uh, it will glow. So you could use those uh, at night as well. Okay? At the end of the day, it is about visibility because our squid, uh, because of the nature of the big eyes, uh, they what we know or what I know, uh, they would hunt by sight, mostly by sight. Of course, there may be other factors that they're hunting, uh, 
um, which I, I really cannot uh, uh, fully explain at this point, point in time. So uh, the key here is uh, visibility and uh, try to present uh, in shallow areas, rocky areas, present uh, slightly bigger uh, big jig, uh, uh, squid jigs, so that you can increase the visibility, All right? All right, uh, so much about the squid jig. Um, now I would like to uh, just uh, elaborate a little bit about how to work the squid jigs uh, uh, in the two different environments. Uh, like in a jetty, what I normally do is uh, I will just let the eggy sink directly down uh, to the bottom until it contacts the bottom and then just hop it, pull it up about a foot or so and then let it drop naturally down again. Okay, this is what I would do uh, if I'm fishing in a jetty. Uh, certain jetties like Labrador Park, perhaps there are certain areas which are shallower, you could also give a short flick out and then do a combination of uh, hopping as well as darting the squid jig. All right. Now when I go out to go down to the islands and play along the shoreline and the water breakers, I will use a method called darting. And uh, one thing you need to also know about the squid jig is that um, when you apply a series of rapid jerks uh, to the squid jig in the water, it will move naturally to the side, from side to side. Okay, and then if you were to do it very quickly or sharper action, it will start to move at a very uh, sharper action, and this is known as darting. Certain squid jigs are manufactured are made uh, to dart wider uh, than other squid jigs. So uh, have a look again at, the, at what the, man, the maker says. Uh, is this a darting? But most squid jigs will dart from side to side. Okay, depending on how much. You do not need to whip your rod to the left and then to the right uh, to dart the squid jig. All you need to do is consistently bring it up and down, uh, which I will show you in a moment. Then your squid jig will go uh, from left to right. Now, another, another, um, another thing that I forgot to mention just now is that the uh, squid jigs are designed to fall naturally at the 45 degree angle. All right? And then it will stay still and once it contacts the bottom the hooks will not touch in contact with the seabed it will just stay like that and how do you check that you do not know right so what i do is when i buy a squid jig from a new brand that i do not know of i will go home i will just take it up and drop it in the basin and i'll take a look in the water see whether it's uh, standing all right if it's lying down it's going to be very hard for you to catch a squid all right, and then it should be, and it should also drop uh, very naturally down, uh, very well balanced. If it start to spiral down, then you also won't be able to uh, catch a squid. I'm not sure whether you get a marble squid, maybe they will chase it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do take note of these are the simple things that I do um, that you can also go and try that cost you next to nothing. All right, better than you spend hours casting a jig that uh, maybe is already off balance. All right. Alright, so coming back to darting uh, the squid jig, um, what I do is, uh, I'll just mock up for you here uh, without the second section, just the top. And uh, when I dart my squid jig, uh, like I said, you do not need to whip to the left and to the right to make the squid jig go left and right. All you need to do is to bring the, the rod up and down, alright, and then the squid will automatically, if there's sufficient tension, it will go left and right by itself. Again. How wide it does uh, depend on the brand and the model of the squid jigs. All right. So how I do it, and I'll just show you from this side to that. I will normally do this like that. Uh, cast. And when I cast out, uh, I take up all the slack. I just make sure that I can feel. First thing is to feel the squid jig, the resistance of the squid jig in the water, and then I can that one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Or I can do uh, if it's in a very shallow water. I just do one, two, three. Then I let it, let the squid jig sink naturally. And then, of course, I also mentally start to do my countdown. Okay, maybe 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. I know it's gone one meter. And if that area is 
uh, about 1.5 meter then I done again one two three so I just continue to do that and uh, think that you should note that the squid will normally uh, from my experience it will only attack the squid jig boom like that okay, you won't die all right you, you spike it this way in once all right then you turn around and then you spike through the head and what it does is that once you hit uh, once it's killed, you will turn white immediately, so you know. Sometimes if you go in a bit wrongly, you'll find that one side turn white, one side normal colour. So you better go and poke it again. <laughs> Alright, so uh, you will put it squarely inside here, you kill it immediately, it will all turn white, and then you turn it around, spike the head as well. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this, this spiking is uh, Ikejime. Um, which can be used also for fish, but uh, not using this spike. Fish uh, will be another fish spike. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a good tool for you to to carry, uh, to have with you when you're fishing. Mm. All right. Uh, don't throw away the the rubber because this one is quite sharp. So you might, uh, you know, might stab yourself. Okay. The next thing I have uh, with me when I go yeah, fishing yeah. is a, a Leo retriever, and uh, how this. Uh, sometimes when you're fishing in uh, very rocky areas and very often, uh, you know, you get, while chasing the squid, you get snagged by the, you know, uh, this, okay, rock, this rock, ah, uh, <laughs> okay, alright, so how this uh, Leo Retriever works uh, is very simple, uh, if you are already snagged and stuck here, so you will put this uh, Retriever, you slide it along your main line, and what it does is that it will go in, all right. You will find the squid jig, it goes in, and locks against the weight of the eggy. And then, uh, of course, with this longer line, you just pull out uh, the squid jig itself. Okay. Now, of course, uh, there are certain areas that you won't be able to employ like uh, this method in case. If the squid jig uh, is snagged like that, so your squid um, jig won't be able to go and find him. So, yeah, in that sense, you probably will lose your squid jig. But uh, if you are, but most of the time, uh, you will find if it's for soft corals, seaweed, uh, you would be able to recover uh, your squid your squid jig using this uh, invention. Oh. Cool, right? <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, of course, uh, another accessory, important accessory that I use uh, with me is the squid guard. Uh, you never know when the biggie is going to come. Mm. Alright? So you never know. It's always better to have a compact. You can of course use a net, but the net is a little bit cum cumbersome for you to carry around. So I use this uh, uh, squid jig. Uh, sorry, this squid guard uh, built by Kanji. This is a, they call it a compact guard. And this is 4 meter in length, telescopic. So far, he has been able to serve me in most of the areas that I fish in. Even uh, from rocky areas, I cannot reach or the, during the, when the tide is not very high. And then the rocks are a bit slippery, right? You don't want to go all the way down there and pull your, pull your fish or your squid up. So you use the squid guard to bring it up safely, all right? While standing on dry rocks, all right? These are very sharp, so be careful uh, whenever you transport this around. Okay, uh, I think uh, I've come to the end uh, of uh, this presentation. I hope I've covered uh, a few things and I hope that you have uh, learned something, maybe something new from here. I'm not sure you have already heard this somewhere before, but uh, I do really hope that you can uh, go enjoy your uh, squid fishing. Uh, importantly, spend more, more time out there, practice on your darting, uh, make it smooth and consistent and enjoy your uh, squidding journey.